73 day journey encompassing thousands and thousands of miles traveled. <laughs> it's amazing to think we started in the desert in Mexico. This lifestyle, just moving from place to place is beautiful, but it's clearly also demanding. I can think of no better way to spend my time than doing this, but you can't do it forever. My name's Andy, and this is a picture from four years ago. Without ever having backpacked a day in my life, I left everything to hike over 2,000 miles on the Appalachian Trail, in the dead of winter, alone. Three days in, the cold had me ready to quit. But before I could, fate or chance changed my course. That's me, Ian. The night Andy walked into my camp, I was three days into my solo hike up the East Coast. And the motivation I left New York City with had all but burned out. But over the night's fire, the two of us, complete strangers, decided to join forces and attempt the hike, together. Just like that, a journey was born. And within those miles, we discovered a freedom that only exists in dreams. At the northern terminus of the trail in Maine, we thought we reached the end. But really, the next chapter had just begun. Back home, in the bustling northeast, days became predictable. And life turned back into its empty grind. And that's when we realized Civilization comes at a price. Less than a year after getting home, we began work on an idea. To capture and share a journey like the one we'd experienced on the Appalachian. We launched an outdoor nonprofit. All right, we're here with uh, the Dusty Camel, two serious outdoorsmen. Dusty Camel is an organization that is dedicated to the preservation and conservation of wild spaces. The way we, we do this is by storytelling. A winter track was published in Geographical Magazine. Then, we were awarded the 2011 Mountain Hardware Adventure Grant, followed by a successful Kickstarter campaign. With support from family, friends, and the outdoor industry, we look towards the next adventure. The Pacific Crest. Beginning on the Mexican border, the trail unravels over two and a half thousand miles along America's west coast, eventually terminating in Canada. And in May 2011, we left our jobs, girlfriends, and families to set out again. Nerves are starting to uh, on their way up and starting to get really excited. This is our first step to the next journey. This is a story about what happens when you stop dreaming about adventure and go find it. Even though we'd done this before, the first stretch is one of the toughest, made even more unkind by the desert's alien landscape. You know, I've been rolling, I've been crying. 
crying all night long. You know I woke up this morning. I didn't know right from wrong. Out here, schedules, plans, itineraries, we're good for one thing. Starting fires. Just the heat and the dryness. Ready for it from what we uh, we read, but until you experience it, kicks you in the ass. The first day's sun turned my hands lobster red. The second day burned them raw. At night, the desert's sweltering highs crashed to freezing lows. It only took the first few days to understand the power, the contrast of this landscape. While our bodies needed time to adjust, we came prepared. A tent that transformed into a canopy to wait out the midday sun, then doubled its walls to withstand the night's freezing winds and keep out the West Nile. Lightweight clothing and gear to adapt to the highs and the lows of life in the mountains. An iPad to check weather patterns, write our trail journal, and touch base with loved ones back east. And a solar panel to charge everything, including the camera. At first, covering miles in the backcountry while trying to capture the story wasn't coming easy. But as the first stretch emptied into the sand, the focus of our first chapter became clear. The baby fat has been burned off, and now I am starving all the time. All right, you are sitting at a McDonald's. What would you order? Two Big Macs, no pickles, an extra large fry, a large Coke, two apple pies, and a McFlurry with Reese's. That's the end of the interview. <laughs> we only had enough room in our packs for about 2,000 calories a day, but we're burning around 6,000. Having gone through the first week's rations, it was time to resupply. With the first hundred miles down, our food bags were empty, and there's only one way to fill them. Even though the trail cuts through a remote wilderness, every so often it crosses a road. Anything from a dirt path to an interstate. Either way, that vein of transportation was the key to getting to town. While hitchhiking's become a taboo in the United States, it's how we resupplied for the entire Appalachian Trail. It felt strange going from three miles an hour to 50. Like we suddenly grew wings and were flying. I'm looking forward to some good food because I'm sure I am hungry. We spent the first few hours in town at a diner eating back the pounds we lost. After scraping by in the desert, her hunger became a potent ingredient. Tonight, we'll sleep well. We filled our empty food bags at the grocery store. While time in the desert felt infinite, in town, it always flew by. Before we knew it, we were hitching back to where we'd left off. Good. All right, all the best. Thank you kindly. Yeah, God bless you. It was hard to leave town. That's why we always packed out a piece of it with us. For the next hundred miles, we'd be eating food as dried out as us. Back on the trail, the view was unlike anything we'd ever seen. Compared to life back east, this was a world in widescreen. And filled with more than just sand. Life was everywhere. we wondered how it could thrive in such arid conditions. On the summit of Mount baden Pal, we'd find an answer. As we ascended, dark clouds surrounded us and brought with them a color we'd yet to see in the Mojave sky, white. After an hour, the squall lifted, revealing an even bigger surprise. As we prepared for the hike in New York City, we'd seen on the news that the High Sierra was experiencing the largest winter in history. As they continue to dig out from this amazing storm that has now dumped 700 
40 inches. Pretty amazing record here at the Sierra. We never expected to see traces of that historic snowpack this far south. Now we realize why there'd been so much life below. The late spring heat was melting the last traces of winter, sending record level snow melt into the desert's basin. We shuddered to think about the frozen lands to the north. Until this point, we ignored what locals had been saying, that no one was making it through the snowed in Sierras. With a high country only two weeks away, we were beginning to believe them. Now in the heart of the Mojave, and over 200 miles into the hike, we looked like the landscape. But we're still a long way from fitting in with the locals. Most were cold-blooded, covered in scales, darting shadows on four legs, and many with no legs at all, armed with a lethal bite. We crossed paths with at least one rattlesnake a day, and having heard the shake of their rattles so many times, we knew they'd give us some notice before our footfall came too close. Makes sense, considering we're about 40 times their size, and not the only giants walking through their front yard. Every spring, about 300 people, or through hikers, attend the Pacific Crest, hailing from all over. Go for it, yeah. Okay. yeah. Climbs are really worth it. Hello, world. <laughs> See? This guy actually climbed Mount Whitney, and he climbed K2 and Everest. <laughs> that was just one weekend. And now he's out here doing that. <laughs> With their own motivations. He beat three types of cancer, and he's out here hiking. Life is good. It's fantastic. See you in a few, big guy. As our first step left the Mexican border, we were inducted into this traveling family. Supported by each other and trail angels. Trail angels are everyday Americans. My name's Paul Berkman. Who made hiking all those miles a little easier. Chris Berkman and Ronnie Berkman. <laughs> There you go. Here you go, gents. Okay, Ian, a little bit of trail magic. <laughs> I don't know if it's twisting them. Thank you, sir. They are. they are. And just like the folks walking the trail, these folks were a diverse bunch. Cool. For PCT through hikers only. And you are a PCT yourself, right? And I'm Barrel Roll. Uh, Moosey and I, right here, did the PCT last year in 2010. Going up what is probably going to be the best burger on the Pacific Coast Trail. 100 miles later, my girlfriend's parents opened their home to us. We brought flowers so our girlfriends wouldn't run from the smell. Though it was tough to say goodbye, the Andersons' self-proclaimed hippie daycare lifted our spirits before continuing north. All the fat, yum. Yep. This is like stoner tea. <laughs> <laughs> By the time we hit Hiker Town, we'd walked over 300 miles. And as we got to know the town's locals, a through hiker named Pooh Bear rolled into camp. Before calling it a night, a decision was made. We'd tackle the final miles of the Mojave Desert together. The first miles with Pooh Bear were some of the driest, but at this point, the three of us were hardwired for the heat, and our new teammate added an almost childlike curiosity to the crew. But we did manage to briefly capture and hold a baby frog. His need to know had taken him far. At 21, he was already halfway to a law degree. As we continued north, we scraped by on water caches left by trail angels. And after another hundred miles, we had new pains to write home about. Exhausted, we reached the end of the last stretch of desert. But when the road for resupply wasn't yielding a hitch, we found ourselves trudging to town. As we crawled towards the horizon, the sun set. And that change of guard triggered something. Our pains 
our worries, the world from which we came, vanished. Our transition into the journey was complete. We were finally free. As soon as we reached the last desert town, a stranger invited us to break camp in her backyard. And the next morning, we traded breakfast for our story. Saying goodbye, we continued north till we hit Kennedy Meadows, a one-shack outpost filled with thru-hikers about to enter the High Sierra. As we waited for the mailman to bring gear we sent ourselves from back east, we caught up with other hikers, listening to the rumors. A colossal snowpack laid ahead. No one was making it through. After gearing up, we exited the bustling camp and quietly ascended into the high country. The climb out of Kennedy Meadows was a struggle. Operating at altitude for the first time was so intense, it separated our group. With Andy miles ahead and the sun setting, Pooh Bear and I had no choice but to break camp without him. I had to improvise my shelter since Andy carried the tent poles. The next morning we reunited and studied the terrain. These were totally different mountains and warranted new methods. The most important... Especially for our first big summit, Mount Whitney, the largest mountain in the continental U.S. As we settled into base camp, news arrived from hikers coming down the giant. A fellow through hiker had been helivacked from the same snow-laden route we would attempt the next morning. Sleep never came, and when my alarm blared at 4.30, we were already on our way. Rising like pillars of a great cathedral, this was the artwork of a glacier's slow brushstroke over time. There was nothing to do but look up. Avoiding snow, we scrambled up loose rock. And the second pitch was on a thin, snowy cattle. The final push was over a massive snowfield. We used our trail spikes to dig into its sharp slope. On the summit, we celebrated the summer solstice in true through hiker fashion. So we're here on Mount Whitney and behind us is all the desert uh, that we just came from. And now all the Sierras that we now have to go through that's gonna be painstakingly slow.
our terrain had changed. If we wanted to make it through the next 400 miles, we needed to change too. How'd you like that? That's the Sierras for you. This was the Sierras, all right, where we used to cover over 20 miles a day in the desert. Now we could barely make 10. Everyone said it's a high snow year, and they weren't lying. This is what we're dealing with all day, every day. Just post hauling other people's footsteps. Hoping we're going the right way. Luckily we have a GPS just in case. Even after slimming our rations, we knew we wouldn't make it to the planned resupply before they ran out. So we decided to resupply at a closer town for food and extra snow gear. With law school on the horizon, Pooh Bear couldn't afford this extra time. We said goodbye and studied our last hurdle before getting into town. A straight climb up and over 13,000 feet. This is the trail. Where? We have no idea. There's a straight up there. And uh, you can see a little snow bank up in the middle of the two mountains there. That's where we're going. Shit. At these heights, one slip meant death. Be careful, bud. It's icy. 13,220 feet right now. And we just found out that the trail is entirely covered with snow. Pushing doubts aside, we descended quickly into Kings Canyon. Not to our feet, but we're on four feet of snow. We're bypassing all switchbacks. This is usually rock when people are going past this. And uh, yeah, we're doing this when uh, there's a lot more snow than usual. So it's pretty, it's pretty gnarly. The weather's like it might be getting a little bad, so we're gonna truck down. We're about a half mile away from camp. It's been an incredibly hard day. Both of our feet are soaked. They've been numb for a while. Hopefully nothing bad's happening. Andy ran off ahead because he needed to keep his feet warm. We should be there soon. Amongst all this chaos, look at the beauty. So it's not all bad, I guess. As I laid in camp, typing my last journal of the stretch, I asked myself, why do I do this? The towering peaks whispered an answer. After a week out, we climbed up a side trail and hitched over 60 miles to the town of Bishop. Civilization never looked so sweet. Made even sweeter when the motel's maintenance guy invited us to a barbecue he was throwing. We dropped our packs and got ready for the feast. Oh, we got these ones. Look, look, no, but really. So about 10 minutes ago, who, who were we talking to? Jesse. Yeah. And who is he? Talk about him. 
You're fucking retarded. What? This is a TV show, dude. Come on, man. This is the documentary. Stop. No, turn it off. No, I'm not. I'm filming this whole thing. So yesterday at this time, where were we? On the side of a mountain. And now what are you doing? No, I'm making steak. That's awesome. That is awesome. That's really cool. And it was funny because I remember thinking on the mountain, you know, in a few short hours, I'm going to be in a motel room eating real food. So my question to you is, should Why we... Why you fucking flush the toilet? <laughs> Stop following me with a fucking kid. All right. <laughs> and you Look, they gave us some towels. I told you, man. She's the nicest lady in the world. What was she doing earlier? Put the fucking camera down. <laughs> Put the camera down. Oh. <laughs> Mountains that we climb, valleys where we fell. Hey, hey, won't you when you're not just in and out of town, it's a different experience. The extra time allows you to get to know the place and the people. Jess was from Montana, and he grew up in the mountains. Instead of exploring them on foot, he did it from horseback. And we're way slower than a horse too, so for us it's well. like I'll bet you, yeah. Probably half the horse walks about twice as speed as a human being. And they can carry ten times what we can. Wow. So why not? We are inadequate to a horse. No. <laughs> it's not true. You guys got a lot more balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On a journey like this. It's impossible to predict whose path you'll cross. And that's the beauty of it. On the third morning, our package of gear arrived. And after cramming our bear canisters with as much food as possible, it was time to leave. Our new friend and his girl, Allison, offered to give us a lift. But first, they wanted to show us something. We headed east, out of town, and began ascending the desert mountains that paralleled the High Sierra. At the top, we hopped out and looked west towards our route. Keep your own and stand your ground. It's a frame of my heart. Sometimes it takes some time to find. Back in the car, we listened to an old recording of Allison. Jess turned it into a duet. The music and our ride ended at the trailhead. A little shrinkage there, hon? Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least that's the excuse. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> nice. <laughs> this was it. Time to say goodbye, not only to civilization, but to our friends. As we moved back into the mountains, I thought about the last thing Jess said to us. Have fun, but remember, these mountains are unpredictable. Focus and you'll make it out. While the winds cut through us, our surroundings remained unflinching. This wasn't a hike anymore. At less than a mile an hour, it had become a crawl. Although this was a piece of our country, we were aliens to it. Completely exposed, completely isolated, we were cut off from the rest of the world. It was a pretty gnarly climb. Uh, we're at about 12,000 feet right now. We've had a weird weather, like tons of snow this last night into this morning, and we did about 12 miles today, and it took us nine hours. But, I mean, 
You hear that? There's just nothing there. And this is our view for the night. lot of work but it all pays off when you get to places like this um, we have about two more passes to get to Mammoth in 65 miles so tomorrow's another day with great beauty comes great danger I can't believe that just a few weeks ago we were in the desert and now it's so much July. It's snowing really crazy. Oh, we got to change the battery on this already. Near mountain in a uh, stone shelter. No water, so we're actually melting some snow. It's actually working pretty well. Five liters of snow for two liters of water. So the one thing that is starting to worry us now is uh, if you look out that window there, we're about to be in a complete whiteout. That it already is. The wind's starting to pick up. Is that it? Is that the wind? Yeah. Alright, you can turn that off now. What you got there, Andy? Ah, well... You know, this morning, we were at Muir... Oh, damn, that's cold. We were at Muir Pass, and there was a ton of snow. And now I'm walking in my Crocs, and what looks like boggy, boggy, boggy Louisiana. Traversing the Sierra's valleys was entirely different than its peaks. Pretty crazy, huh? Picking up our pace, we reached the end of our stretch and shot down a side trail to Lake Edison, dumping out onto the outskirts of a rustic camp. During dinner atop boulders, we realized the date. It was almost 4th of July, Independence Day. We needed to celebrate. So uh, right now I'm walking to a dumpster to find some cardboard. And you might think that's kind of weird, but tomorrow's July 4th, we're going to hitchhike across California to get to the beach in 24 hours. Let's take this back. From our hitchhiking experience, it's best to be simple. On our sign here, just gotta write beach. Should get the point across. July 3rd, 11 a.m. This is the first place that we're gonna hitch. Hope was all we had to get us where we needed to go. And our scruffy look didn't make hitching easy. But we still landed rides. We didn't make it all the way. We did make it to a little town called Chichilla. Tomorrow we just gotta truck on and try again and hope to make it to the beach for the fourth. One of the things that we have to do out here in towns is our laundry because we stink. We have a bathtub going with some hot water, a whole bunch of dirty clothes, a churn to just gross, really, really gross. That's all of our sweat and dirt and just pure stink. Day number two, we've uh, made it about 160 miles. We have about 150 left. So we're pretty excited to uh, get to the beach. It is now 4th of July, and uh, last night was a little interesting. A couple lowriders, teardrop tattoos, pretty sure some prostitutes too, but we made it through the night, so we live to die another day.
So we were on uh, 152 for more than like 15 minutes before we got a ride in Escalade from the Coronas. And now we're in Watsonville, California. We're like 15 miles from Santa Cruz. And it's 1.30 in the afternoon on July 4th. So, time to get in the speaker. Yes. This is America at its best. Walking out of the bodega, we landed our last ride of the trip. Hi, Ian. Hey, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Hi, good meeting you. Happy you too. From the high Sierra to the Pacific Ocean. We're in the Santa Cruz Beach right now. Finally made a 300 mile pitch. Gonna go explore town and set up camp somewhere on the, uh, the beach here and enjoy the fireworks. Surrounded by thousands of holiday beachgoers, we hadn't seen this many people since leaving the Northeast. And when the crowd vanished, we made a toast to Independence Day, the birthday of our freedom. But our celebration was cut short. Locals thought we were hobos and tried running us out of the beach town. This really sucks. We pretty much get hassled wherever we go. We haven't really met that many cool people in the town. People getting us here were great, but it's all part of it. The highs are high and the lows are low. This is definitely a low. So tomorrow we're gonna get out of here. After catching a bus to the edge of town, it was again up to strangers to get us back to the mountains. We met an awesome guy named Tom who drove us a hell of a long way and bought us dinner, so we're pretty happy about that. You're never gonna guess where we are. We are in the middle of Yosemite. We just passed El Cap, got some awesome pictures. It's amazing, but we've had eight hitches today, and that's surrounded by some of the most beautiful nature America has to offer. Tell us the greens in our future. Yosemite National Park is one of the most beautiful places in this country, but this year it's also been the backdrop to a record number of deaths. NBC's Miguel Almaguer is there with details. Miguel, good morning to you. Matt, good morning. Every year there are accidents here at Yosemite National Park, and there certainly has been a spike this year, but park rangers say there's no easy answer why. 14 lives lost in the valley so far. More than twice the usual number. Yosemite's beauty can be deadly when visitors push boundaries. We make it as clear as we can that this is a dangerous area but we can't be, you know, everywhere, you know, throughout the park. It's 9.40 in the morning. We've gone up a thousand feet already. For the rest of the day, it's gonna be downhill and flat, so we're pretty happy and pretty excited to get out of the snow. As we continue past Mammoth, we entered Northern Yosemite, and the easier trail we thought we were walking on changed face. The record snowpack was melting and had transformed northern Yosemite into a maze of fury. As we descended into the deep valley, one raging creek after another cut across our path. How could we ford this? 
every stream meant scouting for safe crossing, and actually stepping into these icy waters meant the possibility of being ripped downstream, almost certain death. With the barrage of stream crossings, we'd lost a lot of time and were nearly out of food. We needed to get to town, but Sonora Pass stood in our way. Out of energy and nearly out of will, we threw what fumes remained into that final climb. Standing at the top of the pass, we saw our road and jumped. This was it, the end of the High Sierra. So we're about halfway right now. We've started to realize our circumstances. We went really slow through the Mojave Desert to let the Sierras thaw out. And then when we got to the Sierras, they weren't thawed out. So we were going slow again. So now we're about halfway. And in order to beat Washington's winter, we have to do more miles in less time, which means we gotta pick up the pace. Now, over 100 miles into Northern California, we faced a completely different landscape. Ancient lava flow formed a thick crust over the land, blocking access to the springs below. I'm a little tired. We still have another 12 miles to go. It's hot as hell out. There's no tree cover, but when there is tree cover, there's bugs everywhere, and they just swarm things. This is a difficult hike. This isn't a walk in the woods, but, I guess it's better than the Sierras. From water everywhere to virtually none, one gear malfunction produced an even harsher reality. So what are we doing, Andy? We ran into a bit of a problem. There was a small hole in our aqua mirror drops. So now we cannot filter water. We're in a very low, low altitude. And there's a lot of cow pastures, so we can't drink from it straight. This is literally the last filtered bottle of water we have. So, it's going to be a long, long afternoon. Last one. We're going to have a little sip now. Miles later, a deep rumble echoed in the valley below. The sound of surging salvation. Cooled off and rehydrated, it was time to make appetizers. We've got our little fly, we've got our tenkara rod, and some line. That's all we need for ten card fish. Wish me luck. Whoa! Look at that. Woo! There we go. We got another one. I've uh, got ourselves a nice little rainbow trout here. It's a, it's a pretty good size, and uh, to be honest, this is the first time I've ever been ten card fly fishing. And it seems to work very, very well. It's a beautiful, beautiful fish. And the best part, that's dinner. We'd never caught and gutted a fish before, so we looked it up on YouTube. Oh shit. We have to cut off his head quick. Hello! I'm about to be eaten! Oh no! Here, fishy, fishy. 
fishy, fishy. Ready? All right, here we go. I just cut off the fish's head. Now you go between the two fins right here. Oh uh, yeah. Look at all that. There's the side of the seafood you don't want. There we go. Fresh rainbow trout. So we're gonna make a little appetizer for dinner. First we got our seasoning, which tonight is a teriyaki seasoning. On the inside. We're gonna take a little olive oil. It adds flavor, so it's tasty. Add some good fats, too. Put that in there. Make sure it's coated all nice. Let's start our fire. Good. Make sure it's low so it's not going too crazy. And then. Looks pretty tasty, huh? We'll let that cook for a few minutes, crisp up, and it's time to eat. And it's done. The skin is nice and crispy. The inside is flaky. Funny to think, 10, 15 minutes ago, this was a live fish, and now we're gonna eat it. That is true food. Now positioned over halfway between Mexico and Canada, we'd come a long way, not just from the border, but from the people who'd left it. Now in the golden days of summer, we ran into flying fish. And here comes the flying fish. <laughs> Never met a fish I didn't like. Me neither. <laughs> After joining forces, we dropped into Quincy, California for a resupply and wound up crashing the Jones family reunion. Later on, they carted us off to the pinnacle of any kid's summer, the county fair. A hundred miles later, we found ourselves on Hat Creek Rim, a 26-mile stretch without any water. We're looking for the, the elusive thru-hiker, and uh, that they, they blend in really well with their surroundings, so it's it's hard to see them. I mean, oh, oh, I, think, I think we got one. Oh, there. Look over there. Oh, what's that? I think we got one. I think we got an elusive thru-hiker. Look at him. Is it? Oh, 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 no. Oh, he saw us. He spotted us. He's running. Oh, well, we gotta catch him! We gotta catch him! Too oh, fast! God. The through hikers are just too fast! I don't know where he went. He's gone. Oh, we, all, we, we, we almost got him. Two days later, a giant loomed in the distance. Mount Shasta, the tallest volcano in California. It definitely looks more climbable, though, the closer you get. The peak stood 50 miles east of our route. We didn't have to climb it but it was right there. Our detour began in the back of a garbage truck. And as we made our way, I snapped shots at the locals. Our last hitch was in a truck named Thor. The owner, Jared, lived out of Thor year round. An improv adventurer like us, he joined our climbing party and we off-roaded to a base camp on the edge of the Shasta Wilderness and spent the rest of the afternoon doing what we did best. After relaxing, it was time to prepare for tomorrow's hike. While Andy and I used aluminum trekking poles, flying fish favored a wooden staff. 
He'd lost his, so he'd show us how to make one. Preferably a young one, tight little grove like this, where you can thin a tree out. Helps the overall health of the tree grove. Next in the process, you win it. Then, peel the bark off. You gotta select the part that you want as your hiking staff. Uh, you go too thin and it's gonna get really bendy and uh, not be very reliable on the steep stuff and when you really want to use it. You go too thick and it's gonna be too heavy and you're doing lots of climbs. It's gonna be cumbersome in, in the way. It's good staff. You'll be able to trust it. Gear ready. It was time for a little fun. Hello and welcome to the PCT Top Shot competition. First up we have fish. Got this is his last shot. Trying to shoot the loose. Oh! Hey, shoot out of New York. He was representing America and he just blew it here. Just blew it. Oh. <laughs> this absolutely. 824. Yeah. Turn date 824. Okay. How many miles did you say it was from the trailhead? Uh, so it's so, summit was seven hours away. Seven hours? Yeah. Already well past midnight we'd start our 7,000 foot ascent in less than three hours. It's three in the morning and we're uh, getting ready to gear up to go up Shasta. It's actually pretty warm out, so we're hoping the conditions are gonna be good and we'll see you at the top. Sun's peeking over the mountains. It's about 6.30 in the morning, and we're just over 9,000 feet, which means we have another 5,000 foot incline to go. But uh, the terrain's been good. We haven't had much snow, and enjoying the sunrise while we can. Axis, our traverse was becoming dangerous, made more risky by the change in weather. After two hours of waiting, the storm finally lifted and we were on our way. But our hearts sank when we came to the final push. A massive snowfield blocked our route. And having lost so much time waiting out the storm, we didn't have enough daylight to traverse around it. So we go down. It's his life. Yeah, fuck. After dusk, we reached camp and rested our sore feet. The next morning, we drove into the town of Shasta. Fish remained quiet in the back of the truck. We found a diner and drowned our defeat in caffeine. After the third round, Flying Fish broke his silence. He was leaving not just our crew, but the Pacific Crest. He hiked nearly 1,600 miles in almost five months. But even though he was a seasoned outdoorsman, Canada was too far. From four to two, we set out on the last stretch in California. After washing up, a stranger rolled into our camp. Hetch Hetchy, a fellow thru-hiker. Surprising, this far north, most thru-hikers had all but disappeared. As the three of us sat around the fire, we noticed something in the air. 
the sharp chill signaled fall had already begun its march south. With a thousand miles between us and Canada, we were migrating the wrong way. The entire expedition hinged on the next three weeks. If we didn't average a marathon a day, we'd hit the wall of winter before reaching Canada. With the new pace came new mountains. And that is why there are trail detours, because we don't want to go through that. The fire didn't just burn the brush. It ignited our senses, tuning into nature really meant tuning out. We gotta keep going, and this is the reason to keep going. It had taken us nearly four months, but finally, we were learning how to listen. I think today is going to be nice on one side and a chance of rain on the other. It's going to be a really, really interesting day. The weather wasn't the only thing breaking down. That's all the peanut butter I have left. We're doing 26 miles a day, <coughs> at least. So I woke up this morning around 4.30. My head was just pounding. And I feel like I'm gonna throw up. And I still feel like I'm gonna throw up. I was gonna eat a Snickers fun size, couldn't do it. 
Closing in on 2,000 miles, our gear was also reaching its limits. And these are my boots that I've used since the beginning. And the whole front is becoming a hole. There was no way around it. We were falling apart. But our greatest threat wasn't from the thunderstorms, tired legs, or holy boots. It was ourselves. The days spent moving through burnt forest brought on a deep and intense solitude. We reacted to the silence differently. Home became my focus, and with 600 miles left, thinking about getting back was my sole motivation to keep going. While Ian's mind drifted from the trail, I immersed myself within it. Capturing the world around me became my source of energy, my shield. Day 135. That is a long way. You start to think about things like, you know, your family and your jobs and everything you haven't had for a long time. Suddenly the dirt becomes what you know. And then forget where you came from. I'm talking to the camera right now. I guess it's better than talking to myself, which happens a lot now. My wandering left the team in the dark. I often fell behind or strayed far ahead, disrupting the pace and pissing off my very tired best friend. Yes. Still recording? Yes, I am still recording. There's nothing to talk about. It's shitty out. How you feeling? Though Hetch remained a silent, balancing force, even his resolve was cracking. <laughs> Nearing the end of Oregon, we stayed at a rustic camp to rest for the night. But even in this beauty, the disconnect between Ian and I lingered. If things didn't change, the two best friends that left Mexico Standing just below the Washington border, we'd cover nearly 500 miles in less than three weeks. Exhaustion aside, we were excited to reach the last state. I'm really excited for this because this means Washington border. That's Washington right there. This is Washington right here. Goodbye, Oregon. Hello, Washington. We're set for it to be cold, and it's extremely, extremely humid. First day ever, we've been forced to hike shirtless. <laughs> and my, have we gotten skinny. By the next morning, the energy we carried over the border dissolved. It's another early morning, it's 7.30 pretty tired now. We don't really know where we are right now either. This is the first morning in Washington. We're in Washington. And yeah. we are... A little anticlimactic. We just crossed the threshold of a new season. The days dragged on. And as the first stretch in Washington ended, we reached a small dirt road. At the trailhead, we saw a birdhouse nailed to a tree. At a closer look, we realized it was actually a miniature Buddhist temple. The card inside read, Trout Lake Abbey, five miles. Hetch thought it would be a good idea to check it out. At the very least, we'd get out of the rain for the night. 
Arriving at the abbey, we were greeted by Kozin. These are just little grain pellets. He showed us around the place and introduced us to some of his friends. <laughs> we showered, ate lunch, and were shown our quarters. Before leaving the next morning, we attended a Buddhist ceremony. Andy and I's first. We sat down and began meditating. I snapped back. Time to go. We uh, stayed in a Buddhist monastery nestled in the mountains a few days ago. Before that, I was feeling a lot worse, but this is just a small piece of time. And this will pass. It's like the desert that we already walked through. Sierra is a really walk through. It's like everything else. In the morning and mid hike, we began meditating. Clearing our thoughts, we experienced a new reality. No longer attaching ourselves to the miles past or ones to come, we existed solely within each step. This new perspective transformed the hike and the team. Are these blueberries or huckleberries? I don't know, I think they're huckleberries. The farther we roamed, the deeper we connected with each other and the nature surrounding us. The two became indistinguishable. One. This new spirit carried us through southern Washington. No, we go up to that peak up there and then down. Another long day. The only problem is this hedge is lost. We used summer up there in that mess of new snow and ridgeline. But uh, we found a nice place to duck down. We might make some coffee. But we're going to wait here for a while. It's the first spot it has been hot in the past couple days. So it's kind of nice. What are we just looking at? The drive, the drive, the dedication, yeah, the will, the determination of all through hikers. That's you gonna need. That's his Yoda. Where's your brother? Twenty-five. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got it made. You're gonna, you're gonna see some pretty shit. You'll be home for the holiday season. Yeah. When you guys get up here at the top of this ridge, Mount Rainier is gonna be right there. Right, right in your face. In about 20 minutes. Yeah. Cool. yeah. One of the best views of Mount Rainier you'll ever get. Awesome. At this point, communication didn't happen through talking. Our world had become too simple for that. Mm. Mm.
Waking up to screaming elk during mating season is a scary thing. There's a whole bunch more. Wow, look at them all. But it only added to the mystique of the Pacific Northwest. Drop into a murky fog on our right. Holy shit, I gotta watch where I'm walking. <laughs> yeah. Holy fuck. It's wow. down there. <laughs> I didn't realize there's that far down. Yeah, we're just down here to read the pond. This was on our tent pole this morning. That is an ice cube. I'm very cold right now. And uh, not looking forward to this. So we are going up some sharp stuff now. We're in the Northern Cascades. And everything is covered in frost. I mean, everything. It's only gonna get earlier from here. As we closed in on the most remote part of Washington, Mother Nature began whispering. Although we just entered fall, winter was in the air. Before continuing north, we dipped into the town of Skykomish to gear up for the cold miles ahead. A couple in town who've been following our trail journal since the Mojave Desert opened their home to us. Peanut butter is not cutting it anymore, so we're gonna make super butter. This is just regular peanut butter. This is good, but this makes it better. But there's the almond, chocolate covered almond in your peanut butter. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Now, this is what really makes it super. I've already put a whole stick of butter in, so I'm just gonna put just a little bit more in, and this is the best. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's, it's cold out there. We packed our bags and got a lift to the trailhead. Their pups saw us the rest of the way out. Run, 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 run! Go, 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 go! We have less than 200 miles to go, and the weather looks like it might hold out. Who knows? Beginning of the end. First fresh snow on the PCT for us. It's pretty early in the season. Whoop. It's pretty slippery. I'm not too excited about what's to come. We still have 180 miles. Even though we'd pushed hard, we'd fallen behind in our race against the seasons. Winter wasn't just coming, it was here. We don't know where we're going. There's fog everywhere. You can't see anything. It's cold, it's wet. We're not too happy right now. Only a few more days. Every ounce of energy on that stretch went towards survival. Since we don't have a mountaineering tent, we have to make sure we are separated from the snow. Not too much space that there's dead air under us, and that's even colder. Crossing our fingers, we hoped for clear skies. But the new day just brought more white. With no other option, we headed out. Complete whiteout. I just can't believe we're hitting tremendous conditions. It's kind of scary to be three days 
from any small road or out there. Look, we got our GPS. Tell us we're on the right track. But uh, it's a good thing because I can't see anything. It's white everywhere. With GPS batteries dead, thin rations, and the three of us on the brink of hypothermia, we needed a miracle. From a white hill to pure blue, we either got lucky, or someone or something was watching over us. Whatever it was, those miles defined beauty. Worn out, we walked to the last town of the trail. On the way in, we ran into a lone through hiker. A Detroit native, Rockfish's hiking partner bailed after hitting winter on the last stretch. Knowing he couldn't continue alone, he joined the team. After stuffing our food bags, we headed back to the trail. There he is, cool man himself. Yo. And as we broke camp, Rockfish pulled a camcorder from his pack. These guys are keeping me moving, which is good. Quite the adventurous hike. It's easy, it's tough, it's beautiful, it's hard, it sucks. This could be the most memorable hike of all. Smile, camel! <laughs> I've been adopted. I've been taken in like the stray that I was. See, the last stretch we did was the last stretch of the last stretch before the last stretch. <laughs> now it's, now the, it's last the last stretch. Fucking stretch. We're within 100 miles of the Canadian border. This is the kind of stuff we're about to go through for that last hundred, but this is the home stretch. We're gonna put the team flag made by my grandma <laughs> on the pack. But I mean, this is it. It's pretty amazing. This is the real deal up here. I think we're, we're at the very end of the envelope. That's it. <laughs> here we go. It's gonna be a battle though. We're not all that high yet. It's already snowing. There's Dusty Camel. We could see the finish line, but there was one last mountain to climb before reaching it. Just dropped into the valley. It's wild. No matter what we're going through. See the weather blowing over the pass up there. You can't see the trail, but luckily we have our GPS. But uh, I was looking at it. We're almost there. Final day, day 100. 
173 day journey encompassing thousands and thousands of miles traveled. <laughs> it's amazing to think we started in the desert in Mexico. His lifestyle, just moving from place to place, is beautiful. But it's clearly also demanding. I can think of no better way to spend my time than doing this. But I can't do it forever. Congrats. Hey, brother. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Rich, anything uh, you'd like to say? I feel like the movie just let out and we're walking outside and this is real life and yesterday was just some epic dream. Very cold. I really, really didn't expect to make it here. That wasn't just doubt. It was dismal. Yeah, this is this is the hardest through hike I've done. And this took a lot. This took a lot out of me. But uh, I hooked up with these guys. H, the dusty camel. And they helped me get through it. I just walked from Mexico to get it up. The Pacific Crest Trail is one of the world's longest trails. It begins here at Manning Park and eventually ends in Mexico. It takes approximately six months. <laughs> My stomach twisted into a knot when I saw the road. Like finishing a book you hoped would never end. We left the mountains. It's a beautiful thing. Signing off on one journey and beginning the next. Most unglamorous part of the trail right here. <laughs> Thinking maybe we should move. <laughs> Holy cow, we got a ride. Let's get going. Are you helping me work on the story, the documentary? Journey complete. It was good to be home. Go. I moved to Brooklyn and began working on this film. I went back home to Manhattan and started taking New Yorkers out of the city. Although life got busy, my camera kept rolling. Look at this in 25 years. Then, six months after finishing the trip, a message from an old friend landed in my inbox. Hetch here. I finally looked at those pictures you sent from out west. I believe there's something within those images, those moments, that define the land we walk through. I have long believed the real power of this nation, the actual quivering, vibrant soul, lies in its wilderness. In this environment, our spirit quickens and kindles the imagination. We are inspired to action. It's the only setting equal to the lofty ideals that lay at our foundation. It would be literally impossible to tell the story of America without channeling the raw, ineffable majesty of that soul. And there's one more piece to this story. It is the spirit of two best friends heading into the heart of the matter, exploring it, getting their asses kicked, and living to tell a new tale with heart 
and imagination. When you share this story, people will see that a journey through the back of this country captures what it's really all about.